answers are certainly not predetermined. So I'm going to ask my wife a question, and uh, then she'll kind of answer it, and then she's going to ask me something. And we'll just kind of go back and forth and see how, how things uh, progress. So here's something that my wife found uh, online, and it's a little statement from somebody that was having uh, grave disappointment in their behavior as a Christian. They said this, I'm tired of failing God. I have failed God for the last time. Too many times have I repented for what I've done. I'm sick and tired of failing Christ saying, I'm going to do better than I do the opposite. I can't change. I wish I could, but I won't. I've showed myself too many times that I can't change. So my question to my, my wife here is, what, what would you say to somebody in a position like that that is a that is a state that someone has gotten through constant condemnation from the enemy so that is a state that if you can that as you mature in Christ you stop it very early on but a new person may not know that. They may think, I know that years back they used to teach that, you know, like the feeling of condemnation was conviction. And that was a destructive teaching because condemnation, uh, when you're, sh shame should lead you somewhere. And if it's just being shame, the enemy works in cyclicals patterns so he starts you at this one thought and then that goes to the next thought it goes to the next thought now you feel rejected again now you don't think your family understands you now you feel like you've always been done wrong and you have no friends and it lead you each day you get up maybe sometimes you win by reading a scripture or by a good prayer meeting but if you don't understand how the enemy works, you will not stop the pattern. So these cyclical patterns are the way that our own defeat is brought out time and time again. We go through this thought process of uh, we're poor. I don't understand why we're poor. We try so hard. We work so hard. We never get any um, breaks. And it just, why are we rejected? We pray all the time. I don't know why we don't have enough money. And these, these little cyclical patterns cause Satan to be able to walk away from you. You're safe in his arms because you don't understand that that is the way the enemy works. God's patterns are, they, they, they can be cyclical, but they always lead you to a higher place. So you may start with praise and worship every time, but it never really leads you back to itself. It always leads you to a higher realm. So what I would say is if someone is in this position right here tonight, the first thing you have to do is go back to the very big basis of faith. And that is, I believe, Lord, that you died for my sins. And I'm asking you to please forgive me. And sometimes people will repent over and over. That's a cyclical pattern from hell. You don't repent over and over and over. That's another way the enemy gets you. You can't feel guilty for the same thing over and over and over again. You'll never move forward. You're only going to be doing this. These are the patterns of depression, right? You get in, you think about that day your mother hurt your feelings, and then how that's affected your life, and how that, and it just goes, it, you never can go back if you stay in these patterns. So the first thing I would say to someone right now, if you are all the way here, go back to the very beginning of faith and start declarations of faith. I know you hear me when I pray. 
I know you forgive me of my sins. I know your blood washes me white as snow. I know I'm a brand new creature. I know I'm made in the image of Christ. So you're changing. It is essential for you to reframe your life. You have to, there's only one way you can reframe it, is verbally first. Say it so often that you believe it. Okay, that takes a little bit of time. Don't think you're going to be able to do this like once a month. This is going to be 10, 15 times a day. You're going to do reaffirming statements because you're trying to change a enemy pattern that is now a stronghold. To break that is no small feat. It didn't happen overnight, and it's not easily broken. It's a rare prayer meeting that will tear it down in one prayer meeting. That's a supernatural miracle. Testify about that. But most of the time, you're going to have to reframe your life step by step in every way that the enemy took that. Now you're going to reframe it and say, I remember that day we didn't have any money, and I don't know how we, I'm even here today. We didn't have no money. We didn't even have no food to eat. But how did the Lord bring us through? Wow. See, you have to totally reframe from poverty into blessing. You have to reframe your entire life. So go back to the very basis of faith. Start believing that the Lord forgives you when you repent. you got to go all the way back there. You actually need to be reconfirmed back to salvation because faith without works, faith without the faith, not having faith, you can't please God. So go all the way back to the beginning and start all over mm-hmm. and become faith-filled. I know you hear me when I pray. I know you forgive me when I fall, fail. And I know you're going to bring me to my place in heaven. So do, do you have... What is, um, I would say, what do you feel is the difference between failing and being a failure? Uh, I would venture to say that all of us would raise our hands if we were asked if we've ever failed God. On some level or another, we certainly must admit that we have. But then if I were to ask you, how many of you consider yourself a failure as a servant of God? Hopefully, no hands would go up, but why? Um, Jesus anticipated Peter's failure when he said, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. He said, but I prayed for you not that you wouldn't be tested, not that you wouldn't fail, but that your faith wouldn't fail. So I would say, number one, a failure is someone who is trying to live according to the ethic and expectation of the word of God and the example of Jesus, and we miss the mark. That's failing. But you're not a failure until your faith fails. Because when your faith fails, you lose incentive to even try anymore. So if someone who fails just gets back up and goes back at it. But a failure loses their faith. Their faith fails. And then... They give up, ultimately, they will give up on God altogether. That's what I would say is the difference between a uh, a a failing and being a failure. Okay, here's a question for you, sweetheart. Eli, the high priest, fell backwards. When he did so, he hit his head and he died. David, King David, fell, oh, he fell a lot more than Eli did, really, but he would fall forwards. And um, he ended up being called the man after God's heart. So, that's mine? Well, then I'm not going to ask you a question for me. 
Okay, let me give you another one. Huh? Me answer it? Sort of related to the last question, isn't it? So look, falling forward is the key. My wife kind of alluded to this in that the enemy wants to keep us tra trapped in the same vicious cycle where we just cover the same old territory over and over again. But God uses failure to push us forward. M many of us are serving God today at the back of our motivation is we got fed up with sin, fed up with living life for ourselves, fed up with all the things that this world has, and we said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. So at the back of, I love it when the devil's efforts to destroy us blow up in his face. And those of you that came like the prodigal son by way of error, and finally in the pig pen you came to yourself, it blew up in the devil's face, and you didn't let failure paralyze you, but you let it launch you into an effort to be the kind of man or woman that would bring glory to God. Okay? Okay, let me ask uh, you this one. How do I stop the devil from beating me over the head with my failures? That's similar to the first one. Mm -hmm. Break the cycle. Go back to the beginning, the basics of faith, and just start again. You can't, always remembering, you can't correct the past. And the future is unlived and unknown. And it will always be the unknown, the unlived, the hoped for. The only thing you have today is the present. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. You'll only ever have today. So today is the day that you don't think about the past. That has to be. You have to take the time. If you think about the past, it's to write letters to yourself on strategies to go beyond what you've been in your past. But you don't, don't ruminate over your past. If you're doing that nonstop, please come and get inner healing. I'm telling you, it works. Over and over again, I see people that have been unable to stop patterns of thoughts, and the Lord heals them instantly, and they're able to move forward, or, they're, or that moment they're healed and peace comes over, their, they're able to move forward. So don't put up with, if you are, if, let's just say this, there's some things that if you could have changed by yourself, or just because, and or just by living a better Christian walk, it would be changed now if it was possible for you to do it on your own. And there's things that some people don't do on their own that they should. Um, they don't try to change themselves. They don't try to better themselves. So just don't let, don't blame the past. Use the past as the launch pad. What is the difference between failure and temptation? Ah, failure and temptation. Temptation cannot be a sin by definition for this reason. Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So 
Number one, temptation does not necessarily need to lead to sin. There's an old saying that I heard so many years ago. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head. But you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. So temptation is what we have inherited through the fall of mankind. We are susceptible to being led astray by our nature. There is a nature in us that's a fallen nature. Paul said it this way, when I would do good, evil is present. Have you ever noticed that when you decide you're going to fast that day, it's like the universe conspires against you to stop you from doing that? The ten good reasons to put it off pop out of nowhere. Uh, same way with prayer. Until you've established the kind of pattern in prayer that the devil realizes it's a waste of his energy to try to stop you, he will try to do everything he can to put a roadblock and to tempt you to give up on your prayer, prayer time. So temptation is one thing. Sin. Sin comes when men are led away of their own lusts and their own temptations and they give in to the temptation to perform something that does not bring glory to God. So temptation can be a thought and stop there. But when it becomes an action, then it turns into a sin. Um, so I think uh, what we need to do with temptation is you need to nip it right away in the bud as quickly as you can. It's very difficult to fight a thought with, with just a negative approach. In other words, let's just say you're tempted to... Uh, Let's say, remember when you were a teenager and you tried to figure out ways to stay home from school? And you come up with stories that were difficult for your parents to detect whether it could be true or not. I have an earache. How do you tell if someone's got an earache? Let's just say you're tempted to tell a story to stay home from school. Um, well, something like that, you have to... you you. You can't stop a temptation by just saying, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. What you're going to do is think about it more. What you have to do is you have to, uh, you have to displace evil thoughts with something pure. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So here's the deal. When you enter into temptation, if you'll just read your, open the Bible, turn it on audio, however you need to do it, to get the Bible coming at you. That's one great way to throw a temptation off track and to literally, you know, wash it out of your thinking. Or worship and praise. Turn on some gospel music and begin to praise God. And you'll discover that that's the way to defeat um, temptation. Not to analyze it. Not to go to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with it. Just displace it with something godly. Something good. Something. Call a, call an, call a friend in the church who inspires you. Right? And... They'll get you thinking in the right direction, even if you never tell them the real reason why you called, just by virtue of the presence of God that's on their life. Amen? So that's... Uh, uh,
after you've fallen, how to frame the failure so that others who are also hurt by your failure can move forward and heal. I think this is important, especially when it comes to moral failures. Um, Sometimes people fail in their Christian walk in a way that's observable to others so that you're not the only one, you or your family are not the only one hurt by um, your actions if you have a moral um, failure and other people know about it. That can that can become difficult in your mind of how can I come how can I ever come back from that? And I think it's important to note that when you find out about the more your moral failure of someone, um, you can be hurt deeply from that. It can you can feel like you're just devastated, and it can take you weeks and months to get over it. But that's in you. The important thing is that that person um, knows that you're there to help them, that you um, are praying for them, that you're not just trying to find out all the news about the situation. I think if someone comes to you who has been um, hurt by some, by let's say a husband and a wife and maybe one of them is the victim and the other one has perpetrated the hurt, okay? So then the one that the hurt has been done against, that person is very, very vulnerable. And you have to be careful with the questions that you ask about the situation. You aren't, uh, you don't have a right to know all the facts um, unless it's something that's, you know, more, but even then, I think it's important that um, people, if it's a leadership, that's that's a different situation than the people among you. Don't need, you don't need to know all the facts about the situation, even if you're best friend. If that's the situation, that's hurtful, and they will open up their heart if they can and if they want to, um, and then you just take that information, but don't. Um, don't make it bigger than what it already is. So don't say, I noticed the way they were looking at her. I seen that. I seen that. Try not to let your spirit get involved because this person is dealing with a lot. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do with this situation, and they may not know the front door from the back. So it's not for you to uh, try to control the conversation. Listen, be a good friend. Don't run to your next friend to tell them all the facts. So there's there's a lot of care. You always have to approach someone um, like there's literally nothing, I don't think, that we haven't dealt with in our office back there. There's no, you can't, you literally cannot surprise us. We could be hurt, but we'll, but to be shocked, we've, we've pretty much heard different things from all over after all these years of pastoring. So you don't have to be afraid that you're going to shock them. They'll either embarrass yourself or something when you need help. It's okay. People fall. People fail. And there has to be a way out of that place and a way to move forward. And I think to the person that's the victim, they shouldn't be told that they should forgive. That's something between them and the Lord. They will have to forgive. It's not for you to tell them what day. It's not for you to instruct them how they should be feeling. It's just you're only there as like someone to hold up their arm. That's it. They tell you how they feel, and then you just listen. You offer support. Don't give tons of advice. You kind of just, whatever they're feeling, sit with them through the moment. I think that's important. When we were teaching grief to a lot of people um, in the grief, the class of, of sorrow and grief, that was one thing that we talked about. 
It's our right to be uncomfortable. It's our right to sit with someone in solitude and silence. It's okay. You don't have to fill all that with being Gabby. Sometimes just sitting with a friend in their sorrow as they weep and cry. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, 1,000 times. That can be annoying. You can just hold their hand. You can cry with them or you don't have to. But it's okay to let people work out their own way through. And when you can tell they're getting into dangerous territory, like, I don't know why God allowed this. But really, it was their husband that failed. You know what I'm saying? You, when you can see them moving into a dangerous thing, like, what do you mean, did God allow this? This is a result of sin. This, is not, this wasn't God's choice. So I think that then, then you can just kind of, then you can kind of just um, pray. You say, let's just take a minute to pray. I know you're going through a lot right now, and I know you're feeling so much pain. And I understand. Just try to bring the conversation back into a place so that they don't get so humiliated and so um, that they feel like they can't be around you anymore. Well, let me just just tag on to that one because that's a that's Big a pretty one. heavy duty topic. Hmm? There are there are failures that that do not involve other people. They're to be dealt with differently than those that involve other people. And so sometimes you might catch wind of somebody have done something wrong, but there was no public discussion about it. When it's all, in every case where it's possible, things should be kept in a, in a confidential manner. For example, if someone came to me and said, Pastor, I got mad at someone at my job and I cussed them out, what do I do? Well, I'll tell you what we don't do is inform the rest of the people here that you didn't cuss out. If we can help it, because that isn't going to do them any good and it won't do the person who made the mistake any good. So many times when it is at all possible, the confidence should be kept between the ministry and the person who has failed. Here's something that I remind people. Once in a while, some recommendation will be given that I can tell the person really has a hard time taking that spoonful of medicine. You know what I'm saying? And they want to second guess the pastor and then go out and get 10 or 12 different opinions from the congregation. Look, that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea for this reason. If you want your your privacy, don't, don't solicit the advice of others as if to say, do you think the pastor did me right in this? Because then what you're asking for is for the thing to come out when the fact is what's trying to be done is trying to protect one's reputation. Reputation is what other people think of us. Character is who we really are. For the most part, our reputation far outshines our true character, okay? That's probably the case with most of us. But so we want to protect reputations as much as possible. This is why my wife said, try not to ask too many questions. If something comes to you, especially if you're not part of the solution, then your part of the solution is to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted, lest you also, be, are you ready for this? You can invite the same spirit that caused failure in another to come and attack you if you act in a condescending, holier than thou, uh, I told you so attitude. The Bible says, help people in the spirit of meekness. By being meek, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is just uh, keeping the flesh from glorying in itself. Because look, it's easy for the flesh to become, to gloat in, over someone who made the mistake that you just, that just isn't in your, you know, 
venue. That's just not a problem for you, right? Um, someone may say, well, you know, I went over there and I, 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 I gambled the house payment away at, the, at, the, at Cherokee. Well, maybe you've never pulled a slot machine handle in your entire life. To you, that's almost absurd. And so it's easy to say, what kind of person are you? Don't you have any self-control? But then let someone cut you off in traffic, and next thing you know, you're ready to go ballistic on them. So, you know, we, we forget. It's easy to pontificate. That's what I mean. You know, pontificate over someone else's failure who, who you have absolutely no temptation in that area at all, especially then. Practice meekness and say, you know, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to extend a hand of fellowship. I'm going to be an ar a shoulder to cry on and a source of strength. God's going to help you and bring you through this in Jesus' name. So, Otherwise, I don't want to attract a spirit to, uh, to attack me with the same thing that I you had something God showed you about. What was that? Uh, uh, disdaining something. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. What was that? Um, a couple nights ago, um, my husband and I have been just doing a, some fasting and prayer and sanctification. A couple not, I, I've been asking the Lord, you know, show me anything because basically I'm doing everything that I think. I should be doing so you only you know if I'm doing something offensive you know and um I said that before I went to sleep talk to you while I'm asleep wake me up that type of thing and right before I was fixing to wake up for the morning I came to that state where you're still not moving but you're coming to and as I did I started quoting the scripture he Blessed is the man who standeth not. Walk, stand, uh, walk my in the memory. Ways, you know, stand and sit in the seat of the scorn. Walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And the Holy Spirit said, that. And I just thought. And it showed me a post. There's, there's this, per, there, you know how when you get on social media, every once in a while there'll be people that are, you, you can see that they're narcissistic because they're just, they're making the most of all of everything they are. Like they rename <laughs> every job they've done and they yeah. make it seem so much more important yeah. and so better. And you see these, you know, you kind of just giggle and go on through. And I want you to know that the Lord showed me one that I've never, I've only, whenever we, it ever came up as was somebody was showing me the post and I was going, oh my Lord, <laughs> you don't, don't sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you see it on, on social media. Some people, their children come and ask them like questions from the Bible every day. You know what I'm saying? There's people <laughs> that you just go there. This person's not even real right now. <laughs> And um, it was one of those people, but the Lord showed me the post, and he said, stop it. And I was like, I'm so sorry. You want to know the truth? I've only ever thought something in my own heart. I said a, something to a couple other people that were already bringing the post to me to talk about and saying, did you read that? I would go, oh, my God. Well, yeah, that's wild. But the Lord does not even want me to sit in the scornful in my own heart. To sit in the seat of the scornful. Like I even, I couldn't even move yet. I was still in that sleep paralysis. And I just said, oh, my Lord, please forgive me. I don't want to offend you in any way. But, you know, his, he's so holy that we got a long ways to go yeah. to move up to his step. And I'm not ashamed to admit that it's beautiful when the Lord shows me something else I can do to be like him. Oh, that's powerful. 
Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we stand? No. You got more? You want to? Wait a bite. All right. We got more. We may do this again. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. I just thought you ended that on such a powerful note, and that is introspection, right? Try my heart. Examine my ways. See if there's any wicked way in me. Don't let me ever think that I'm better than somebody else or that, you know, don't let me frown on another person's attempt to serve God. If it's a genuine attempt, let me help them get there. How many's ever had to learn something from someone who knew how to do it and you had to learn how to do it? Boy, you really appreciate a gentle uh, instruction there. Let's ask God to... Let's ask God to give us insight into our own self. Precious God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the power of your spirit, Lord. We know that you're in this place. Lamb of God, you're worthy of the highest praise. We need your help and your direction, the presence of God. In Jesus' name, mighty God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your power and your spirit in Jesus' name. Now let me say this, if this has prompted some questions for you, I just feel this. Maybe we could come back next Wednesday and ask, answer some questions you might have. All right. So if you do, put it on a little note paper, give it to Joanne, she can give it to us on Sunday, and maybe Wednesday we can do it again. I feel like, I feel like we covered some good ground. You feel that way? Yeah. Praise God. Let's give God some praise. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Amen. Shake hands, be friendly, greet one another.